Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss monitoring milk urea nitrogen, or MUNS. To understand milk urea nitrogen, let us try to trace through how it is formed and where it comes from. So let's start out in the rumen and look at the action in the rumen. When we feed a nitrogen, and that's kind of the key ingredient, although many of us would call that protein, we will look at the rumen degradable protein and the soluble protein fractions that will degrade in the rumen at various rates and at various amounts to ammonia. For example, halage will degrade faster than would be some other protein sources or nitrogen sources. When the ammonia is produced, if it is too high or if the bacteria cannot capture it, meaning made into microbial protein, the ammonia then is absorbed and transfers across into the bloodstream. Bad news for the cow. That will change basically blood pH. The sentinel organ, in this case the liver, quickly converts this toxic ammonia into urea and it will then be secreted into the blood as blood urea nitrogen and that event requires energy just like any time we synthesize a component in the body. Now let's move into the bloodstream. We now have the BUN or blood urea nitrogen formed by the liver and this goes into the bloodstream and several things can happen to it. First, it can be recycled in saliva, and this is very good news because it has another chance to be incorporated into microbial protein. Or it can be excreted into urine, excreted by the kidney, or the milk can actually increase in level because milk is made from blood. The MUN value will usually lag behind the BUN value, which means milk levels will be about two hours behind the blood levels. Now be aware this is a water-soluble product, so it moves back and forth. So basically it's about a two-hour lag. This is important to basically interpret the results because a relationship of feeding time to milking time will be very important. And of course variations in feed intake and feeding pattern will also influence MUNs on various farms. This slide comes from the University of Wisconsin, extremely complicated. I'm not going to walk you through this because it would be very difficult on this module. You'll notice, however, if you look on the left side, about at the 10 o'clock time, you'll see N intake. This is all based on nitrogen, not protein. Remember your thumb rules now. You multiply nitrogen by 6.25 to get the pounds. So here you see 494 grams of nitrogen. That is going to be over 6 pounds of nitrogen, or in this case protein, coming into the ruin. This slide then tracks where this nitrogen goes. It's an excellent module, so it shows how many grams of nitrogen go to the liver, how many go to the small intestine, how many are made into microbial protein, how much is recycled, what goes to the mammary gland, what goes to the kidney, and the levels in the bloodstream at various sites. So it's a very exciting slide, one that you'll have to really study. Won't be exam questions off of this, but this is what your cow does with nitrogen when it comes in and determines if it ends up in milk, in urine, or into uh, tissue as far as that goes. Exciting slide from the University of Wisconsin. Study it, kind of gives you all the numbers and gives you an idea of what the rate and what the amounts are in the circulation of the dairy cow. Well, let's get down now. We understand where it came from, how the cow circulates it around. Let's do some interpretation. The normal ranges we expect are about 10 to 14. In fact, uh, values as low as 8 or 9 can be very acceptable because if we're really capturing the rumen ammonia, then the cow is very, very efficient. Values under 7 may be an indication of a shortage. Relook your rations. A value over 16 may be a potential problem in terms of reproductive performance. Values over 20 probably indicate infertility risks. Values up around 30 or 40 indicate your cow is probably ill. So therefore, you want to develop kind of what we call a normal MUN profile on the farm. Every herd will have a different number because of such factors as time of feeding, time of milking, feed selectivity, cow sorting, cow consumption, times a day feeds are pushed up. All these things come into play. Plus, there is a lab variation. So all labs see it a little bit differently, much like on forage testing labs. And so we have lots of variables. The key is what is normal for you. And then also remember, normal variation is plus or minus three points. So in other words, if my value is 12 this week or this month and 13 next month, it went up, but statistically probably didn't change at all. We're looking for big changes and big swings, and then you must ask, why did that number change? Looking at various models for optimizing MUN, certainly you can look at these various studies listed in the literature. These are listed by researchers, some are from Maryland, some are from Wisconsin, showing what these models would predict based on intake. And you can see this number runs around 10 to 12, which is a pretty good baseline. So it gives you a pretty good idea what we would predict based on various 
feeding and research studies. So then let's go back and look at some variables, and we'll show you some data here in just a few minutes. Ready talk for bulk tank milk samples. We would like to see weekly or monthly values. I prefer to have a weekly average because bulk tanks will jump around a little bit, and I cannot always explain that. On DHI records, look at groups of cows. Pennsylvania researchers suggest groups of eight or 10 cows should give you plus or minus one point from the real value. I would look at such things as lactation numbers. Are the first lactation cows higher or lower than older cows? That would tell me me something. Level of production. Are the cows giving 120 pounds of milk have a different run value than those that are giving 60? Days in milk. Fresh cows versus mid-lactation versus late cows as far as that goes. And be well aware that DHI and milk co-ops such as Prairie Farms may not always be the same because of different labs and different equations. Next, let's take a look at breed impact. If you look at this slide, you can see that the brown Swiss tend to have higher values and do the jerseys. Makes a bit difference if they're in single herds or multiple herd differences, but you can see there are some breed differences, and this will be important in consideration depending on what breed you have on the farm. This PowerPoint illustrates the impact of breed. You can see two comparisons, multi-breed in a herd, which means if you had Jerseys and Holsteins in the same herd versus those that were a single breed herd. The bottom line simply is that Brown, Swiss, and Jersey tend to be higher than Holsteins. Cannot explain that to you, either in the single herd or multiple herd levels, but you can see there are breed differences. Another factor will be looking at monthly averages. While this data is a bit old, you can see from Wisconsin, there is variation at the time of the year. Generally speaking, in the summer, you'll see lower values than you'll see in the winter, and they'll vary from year to year, depending on such things as heat stress and forage quality and feeding programs. Another factor will be time of day. In this Wisconsin database, which is very similar to Pennsylvania database, you can see that the PM numbers are slightly higher than the AM numbers by one or two points, probably reflecting activity of feeding during the daytime versus at night relationship to milk production. So certainly we recommend to sample cows if you're on DHI test, basically on the PM milking, which will catch the higher number. One of the really important PowerPoints would be this one in front of us, and that is what is optimal for what? A beautiful PowerPoint put together based on some data looking at what you want in terms of protein efficiency versus protein yield. On the left side, you will see MUN levels that are modestly low, 5 or 10. That translates into the most efficiency, which means the cows will take most of the nitrogen and put it into milk production. So if your goal is to have very high feed efficiency for milk protein, then a low MUN will be advantageous. Notice on the right side, much higher numbers in that 16 to 20 range. That will end up on the right side in terms of milk protein yield per cow in grams per day, and that is what a farmer is paid for. So you can see a very interesting dilemma. Does a farmer want to be paid for his protein, which means he's going to waste some nitrogen, or he's going to be environmentally very conscious, cut back on the amount of protein, reducing environmental load, but then maybe lose some production and profitability. Powerful slide to think about. Well, let's say that our MUN is high or low. What should I do? Just accept it? Here are some other things I encourage you to think about. If the MUN number, for example, is very high, let's look at total protein in the ration, rumen degradable protein and soluble protein numbers. Are those numbers too high? Conversely, if the MUN is low, are those numbers on the low side? Number two, look at ration sugar and starch levels because that will jumpstart the rumen microbes. So you may be wasting nitrogen in the rumen because you don't have enough fermentable carbohydrate for the microbes to capture it. Also take a look at the milk protein levels, in other words, the percent protein. Holstein cows should be around 3 to 3.1 percent protein. If your MUN is really low and milk protein is low, you're starving the bacteria and vice versa. But then also look at the ratio of milk fat to milk protein because that is important as well. And finally, look at manure. If the manure is very loose and, and consistency, that would tend to be associated with high protein diets. If the manure is really stiff, like a dry cow, that would imply lower protein protein levels in the diet and would apply lower MUN values. So you can use MUN as another tool to assess protein dynamics in the dairy cow. So let's define a few of these variables. If we look at protein levels and MUN levels, these would be the numbers we would be looking for for a high producing dairy cow. I will not read all these numbers to you because we will discuss these in some other modules. But it says if MUN numbers are going to be around 10, 11, or 12, I'd expect these values to be on your ration sheet.
A bit earlier, we talked about the ratio of milk fat to true protein. Based on the most recent issue of Horst Dairyman, you can see this relationship by breed. For example, typical for Holsteins is 3.69% milk fat. Protein, true protein would be 3.0. So if I divide the fat into the protein, that's a ratio of 81%. Or conversely, if you divide protein into fat, that comes out at 1.23. So if your milk protein is high or low, First, look at see its relationship to the fat level, because that may indicate some other nutritional factor or rumen conditions going on in the herd. Let's look at another factor with milk urea nitrogen, and that is economics. Are we losing money? Can we make money? Let's use an equation developed by Wisconsin researchers, which looks at the suggested amount of MUN and what it has on protein dynamics. We take the body weight times this constant times the MUN value. So I have a 1,500-pound Holstein cow with a 14 MUN. She would excrete about 271 grams of nitrogen. If that same cow or group of cows had the same body weight, only had a 10 mun value, then she would excrete about 194 grams of nitrogen. Now that may not sound like much, that difference is 77 grams, but that translates into slightly more than 2 pounds of 48% soybean meal. You can do the math on that. If soybean meal is worth 10 or 12 cents a pound, you can see there's 22 to 30 cents there that you could reduce in feed costs and still hopefully maintain milk production and milk protein levels. So let's wrap up this module with a few take-home messages. Number one, MUN is just another benchmark to evaluate protein status, carbohydrate relationships, and rumen function. Next, environmental applications may be based on nitrogen excretion and losses. This is occurring in the Chesapeake Bay area right now as we speak today. And finally, recognize that MUN values do not replace DHIA values, and they may vary from time to time, but both of them are very valuable tools. Thanks. That completes this module. Have a great day.